Um, this, session, this afternoon's session is on neurosciences and consciousness, and we have uh, uh, great and distinguished speakers. So without further ado, I will have Dr. Steven Grossberg uh, tell us about towards the solving the hard problem of consciousness. Can you hear me in back? Good. Well, I'm delighted to be able to speak to, to you today about an exciting and, as you know, very challenging problem towards solving the hard problem of consciousness, the varieties of brain resonances and the conscious experiences that they support. In fact, I have an open access paper that was just published. It's on my web page, or if you search under the name and my name, anyone can read it for free. It says a ton more than I can explain to you today. Well, what is the hard problem? Most of you know already, but it's the problem of explaining how and why we have qualia or phenomenal experiences. Chalmers has said the really hard problem of consciousness is the problem of experience. When we think and perceive there is a were of information processing, but there's also a subjective aspect. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy goes on to say, the hard problem of consciousness is the problem of explaining why any physical state is conscious rather than unconscious. It's the problem of explaining why conscious mental states light up and directly appear to the subject. We can still meaningfully ask the question, why is it conscious? Before jumping in, it's therefore fair to ask, what kind of event occurs in the brain that is anything more than a word of information processing. And what happens when conscious mental states light up and directly appear to a subject? Our brains sometimes go into a context-sensitive resonance state that can involve multiple brain regions. And in fact, many years ago, I predicted that all conscious states are resonance states, and so far, no, no disconfirming data. But since not all brain dynamics are resonant, consciousness is not just a word of information processing. Well, what is a resonant brain state? It's a dynamical state during which neuronal firings across a brain network are amplified and synchronized when they interact via reciprocal excitatory feedback signals during a matching process that occurs between bottom-up and top-down pathways. A central claim of this work is that conscious states are part of larger adaptive behavioral capabilities that help us to adapt to a changing world. So I believe there are resonance for conscious seeing that help to ensure effective reaching, for conscious hearing that help to ensure effective speaking, and for conscious feeling that help to assure effective goal-oriented action. And in fact, a classification of resonances has begun. Surface shroud resonances support conscious seeing of visual qualia. Feature category resonances support conscious recognition of visual objects and scenes. Stream shroud resonances support conscious hearing of auditory qualia. Spectral pitch and timbre resonances support conscious recognition of sources and auditory streams. Item list resonances support conscious recognition of speech and language, and cognitive emotional resonances support conscious feelings and recognition of them. In the pre-conference workshop, I talked about these three a little, Today, I'll talk about the first two. So today, I'm mostly talking about vision. But this is a cautionary tale. If one doesn't understand a lot about how vision, audition, affect, and recognition actually work, then you can't say anything deep about how, when, and why their representations of individual experiences become conscious. So the talk will review aspects of this knowledge, but I need to emphasize that a huge amount more has been explained and predicted over a half century of systematic theory construction. 
I want to make a disclaimer. I never tried to study consciousness. I just try to understand how psychological data emerge from individuals adapting autonomously in real time. But that always led to models of how brain mechanisms interact together to give rise to dynamic brain representations of individual conscious experiences, as well as parametric properties of psychological data about conscious experiences. And here I mean lots of psychological data, many hundreds of experiments. And this gradually developed a linking hypothesis between brain dynamics and conscious mental experiences. These analyses led to the discovery of adaptive resonance theory, or ART, over 40 years ago. Some of you may know that a unifying theme of ART is what I like to call the stability plasticity dilemma. This asked, how can learning continue into adulthood without causing catastrophic forgetting? Or how can we learn quickly without being forced to forget just as quickly? Or it's been incrementally developed ever since, and I think it's fair to say that it's currently the most advanced cognitive and neural theory in the precise sense that it has the broadest explanatory and predictive range about how brains learn to attend, recognize, and predict objects and events in a changing world. And I'm comfortable telling you about this because all of the main art predictions have now been supported by both psychological and neurobiological data. Moreover, art works. It's used in many large-scale applications, engineering and technology. If you want to see a few of them, look at the CNS Tech Lab website. This is a subset of large-scale applications. What's the art main idea? It's that top-down attentive feedback encodes learned expectations that dynamically stabilize learning and memory in response to a changing world that's filled with unexpected events. And to accomplish this, art claims that object attention obeys what's called the art matching rule, which is embodied in a top-down modulatory on center off surround network. Well, what do those words mean? Well, let's say bottom-up inputs are trying to activate some feature-sensitive cells. Other things being equal, which they often are not, they can do so. But let's say a category gets activated and tries to read out its learned prototype to excite these cells. Well, it can't fully excite them. It can only modulate them because that excitation is approximately balanced with an inhibitory off-surround. This is a case of one against one. But if the bottom-up inputs and the top-down prototype converge on some cells, then it's a case of two excitatory against one inhibitory. These cells are selected. The others are inhibited. The selected cells can be synchronized, amplified, and contrast-enhanced, starting to form an attentional focus. Moreover, we know the lamina neocortical circuits with identified cells that realize the art matching rule. There's a lot of support for it. It's known in many experiments, attention does have an on center off surround network. There's just a small subset of them. Attention can facilitate match bottom up signals through its excitatory modulatory on center. Also, between the, the link between attention and learning has supportive data in visual perceptual learning, auditory learning, and somatosensory learning, as is the link between attention and synchrony, sometimes embodied by synchronous oscillations, and the link between consciousness and synchrony. How does adaptive resonance get into this story? Well, the attended feature clusters reactivate their bottom-up pathways. The activated categories reactivate their top-down pathways, causing a feature category resonance that synchronizes, amplifies, and prolongs system response while focusing attention on these guys. 
And it's that feature category resonance that can trigger learning in bottom-up adaptive filters and top-down learned expectations, which is why I call it adaptive resonance. And by suppressing outliers, you solve the stability plasticity dilemma. So that's how feature category resonances support conscious recognition of visual objects and scenes. I want to emphasize that attention, whether it's object, spatial, or motivational, plays a key role in all these conscious resonances. But in contrast, Christoph Koch, who you know is a great leader in the consciousness research field, has written that subjects can attend to a location for many seconds and yet fail to see one or more attributes of an object at the location. Here he's talking about the phenomena of visual crowding. And that's true, and it leads Christoph to say attention doesn't have anything much to do with consciousness in this case. But I will explain these data using properties of surface shroud resonances in which spatial attention is essential in determining what we consciously see. So I just think Christoph didn't understand how these work. So we need to understand a little how surface shroud resonances support conscious seeing of visual qualia. But first I need to give you a little background. I want to point out that there are more and more models that link detailed brain circuits to the adaptive behaviors that they control. But in so doing, they describe new paradigms for brain computing. One such paradigm I like to call complementary computing, which asks what is the nature of brain specialization? Complementary computing exposes us to new principles of uncertainty and complementarity that clarify why there are multiple processing streams in the brain with multiple processing stages as illustrated by the famous macro circuit diagram by Van Essen and his colleagues of the visual system. Well, what are complementary properties? There are analogies, like a key fitting into a lock or puzzle pieces fitting together. Let me say in words, properties of them then illustrated with explicit examples. Computing one set of properties at a processing stage prevents that stage from computing a complementary set of properties. And these complementary parallel processing streams are balanced against one another. It's a very yin-yang-y kind of situation, such that interactions between the streams overcome their complementary weaknesses and support intelligent and creative behaviors. And I say this with some confidence, because now we know there are quite a few pairs of complementary processes with a lot of psychological, neurobiological, and modeling support for this claim. This is just a few of them. But if you put even these together, you get an emerging unified theory of visual intelligence starting in retina, going all the way to prefrontal cortex, including the what and where cortical streams, where I claim that a lot of these macro interactions are there to overcome complementary processing deficiencies of each process if it tried to do its job all by itself. So let me tell you right away two issues about vision to set the stage. They're both trivial, which just illustrates their profundity. So when you move your eyes to look at the world, previously foveated objects shift to the periphery in a direction opposite to your eyes. We experience this several times every second. That shows that conscious visual percepts are computed in retinotopic coordinates, because what you see is shifted. However, the perceptual stability as we scan the world depends on head-centered coordinates that are invariant under eye movements. Let me illustrate what I mean. Suppose you're trying to binocularly fuse a Euler stereogram or magic eye autostereogram, it can take tens or hundreds of milliseconds to fuse it to see the hidden figures in it. But after fusion occurs, fusion can be maintained when the eyes move across the image. And if vision used only retinotopic coordinates, it should take just as long to refuse the image after each eye movement. 
So we need to ask how and why do head center coordinates, which are invariant under eye movements, prevent this from happening? Then there's a question about figure ground separation. This is a trivial image, just three rectangles, but they induce a compelling percept of a horizontal rectangle in front of a partially occluded vertical rectangle. So we have to ask, how is the horizontal rectangle completed behind the horizontal rectangle? What in the world does that mean? This is just a 2D image. And why don't we see the occluded vertical region? If we always did see it, then all occluders would look transparent because you could see behind the occluder this occluded thing. And that could easily interfere with the development of reaching because you don't know what you're supposed to reach. So my claim is that a major design tension between seeing and recognition is resolved by interactions between cortical areas V2 and V4, and I'll briefly sketch that for you in a moment. So let's get back to this background that all the key art predictions have behavioral and neurobiological support. All conscious states or resonant states is a very old prediction. One that isn't quite so old is that all conscious visual qualia are surface percepts. But to know what that means, I have to ask, what is a surface? And here we get to uh, an important example of complementarity between visual boundaries and surfaces. And if you're studying boundaries and surfaces, this is the part of our macro circuit between V1 and V4 that we have to worry about. I like to use the example of neon color spreading to illustrate what I mean. This looks washed out to me, but can at least some of you see the bluish tinge in the square region? If not, I'm in deep trouble. But you know, at home you can easily see it, even though the image is just made out of black and blue arcs. So there are at least two things going on here in boundary completion and surface filling in. Boundary completion creates this illusory square, and it does so in an oriented fashion between pairs or greater numbers of inducers. If it did it just from a single dot on your uh, image, then you'd get cobwebs of boundaries that drive you nuts. So it's oriented and inward in the boundary domain, but color is spilling out of where the black and the blue boundary come together for reasons I can't explain today, and when it spills out, it spreads in an unoriented fashion outwardly until it hits a boundary. Oriented, unoriented, inward, outward. You begin to see what complementarity means here. But what does insensitive to direction of contrast mean? Well, that has to do with the distinction between seeing versus knowing, or seeing versus recognition. For example, if you look at the Ehrenstein figure, it's just blue lines on white paper, but I think all of you can see and recognize this emergent circular boundary because it's brighter in here than there, which isn't part of the image. So you see and recognize it. But the offset grading, I hope you can recognize that there's some kind of salient vertical boundary there. But you don't see it. It's not brighter or darker or a different color. So this is an example of an invisible or amodal boundary. So some boundaries are, are invisible. But I predicted many years ago that all boundaries are invisible, at least within the boundary stream. And there are several reasons, but one reason is to help to recognize object boundaries in front of textured backgrounds. So for example, if I go around the circumference of this gray disk, I have gray black that's light dark, gray white that's dark light, light dark dark light, light dark dark light. If all I did was build a light dark boundary, there'd be holes in between and stuff would spread out. If all I did was build a dark light boundary, there'd be holes in between and stuff would spread out. So what nature does is at an early processing stage at each position, there are similarly oriented simple cells that are sensitive to either dark light or light dark, and they add their signals to generate activity at a complex cell that responds to dark light or light dark, thereby giving you a boundary around the entire image. 
But if you pool over opposite contrast polarity, it can't carry visible qualia. So to say insensitive to directional contrast or pooling over it implies all boundaries are invisible, at least within the boundary stream. But if boundary is invisible, then how do we see? Well, here the claim is that's due to filling in of surface color, where there are hundreds of examples. But let me just remind you of these two, that boundaries define the compartments within which lightness and color spread. And so that leads to the idea that you are filling in a visible color and lightness being the sensitivity direction of contrast, otherwise expressed all visible qualia or surface percept, and that completes the complementarity here. To be a good boundary, you can't be a good surface, but you can't do anything without their strong interaction. Complementary. So therefore, in 84, I predicted that all boundaries are invisible in the interblob stream, all visible qualia are surface percepts in the blob stream, and I don't know any disconfirming data. But let's go back to our predictions. If all conscious states are resonant states, all consciously visible qualia are surface percepts, there's a burning question here. What type of resonance supports conscious percepts of visible qualia? Or how do we see? And that drove me crazy for decades. And now I'm able to predict it's a surface shroud resonance. But why did it take me so long? Well, it's because to fully answer this question, we need to study invariant object learning and recognition. And that's not easy. So to do this, we need to face other basic questions. What is an object? How does the brain learn what an object is under both unsupervised and supervised conditions? And how does the brain intelligently scan a scene with eye movements, as in this exquisite early psychotic um, uh, uh, data plot from Yarbis in Russia? Why don't the eyes just jump around randomly? And if you put these two together, we need to ask, how does the brain learn to bind multiple views of an object into a view and variant object category while scanning its salient parts with eye movements. There's a basic question in active vision. And to do this, we need to go higher in the system. We need to talk about spatially invariant object recognition and attention and spatial attention and tracking in IT, infratemporal cortex and posterior parietal cortex. So during unsupervised scanning and learning about the world, no one tells the brain what views belong to which objects while it learns view and variant object categories. If I have an eye scan of these three pairs, if I put it through the cortical magnification going to V1, which is just a log polar map and we're not doing any more pre-processing, that's what you'd see. And I defy you to tell me if it's one pair, two pairs, or three pairs. But the brain must somehow be able to learn multiple views of an object when the eyes move on its surface. But stop learning about that object when you move on to another one or you'd have promiscuous blurring of view uh, uh, um, uh, associations. So let me tell you uh, the proposed solution in words and then develop it uh, much more explicitly and explain data with it. A pre-attentively formed surface representation, for example, in cortical area V4, pre-striate cortex, activates what's called an attentional shroud in the spatial attention system, like posterior parietal cortex. The claim is that an active shroud inhibits reset of an emerging view invariant object category as it's being associated with multiple learned view specific categories of the surface, and these are being reset as the eyes move. So let me say that again. You're looking at multiple views of the teapot. Let's say a certain small set of views gets quickly learned as a view specific category, infratemporal cortex posterior, and that activates some cells in infratemporal cortex anterior. Now when the view changes enough, this category shuts down, to learn another view specific category which you want to associate here, and then another which you want to associate here. By associating many of them, this becomes view invariant. 
However, when you shut the first one off, you shut off the input that turned that on. Why haven't you pulled the rug out of it? Why doesn't it shut off? And the claim is an attentional shroud prevents that. So an attentional shroud is surface-fitting spatial attention that marks the objecthood of an as yet undefined object category. The words due to Christopher Tyler, a number of other scientists know that spatial attention fits itself to surfaces. But I predicted that in addition, shrouds enable learning of you and variant object categories. And let me tell you how I think that works. First, we need to ask, how do you get a shroud? Let's say I'm looking at a cross-sectional area of a very simple surface. This is a somewhat more luminous bar, somewhat less luminous bar. It's, this surface is going to bid topographically to grab spatial attention in parietal cortex, and you're going to have a lot of competition for that attention. But in addition, you're going to have top-down excitatory feedback converting this into a recurrent on center off surround contrast enhancing net that grabs most of this activity in a form-specific way via a surface shroud resonance. And the top-down excitatory feedback would enhance the perceived contrast of the attended surface, as has been reported both psychophysically and neurophysiologically. So an active surface shroud resonance means that, attend, that sustained spatial attention is focused on the object surface. And we try to explain this in the family of art scan models, which show that many brain regions need to interact to do this. I'll just tell you the main points. First, <coughs> an, active surf, an active shroud maintains activity of a view and bear an object category as the eyes move. So let's say I have an active surface shroud resonance. I'm learning view specific categories, associating them with an emerging invariant category. I don't want this to get shut off. And the reason is the shroud is inhibiting category reset cells in parietal cortex, which otherwise would have shut it off. Now, why should you believe that? Because a spatial attention shift, read collapse of the shroud, causes a domain-independent transient parietal signal, read burst of category reset activity, which causes a shift in categorization rules, mean, read, shut off this invariant category so you can pay attention to another surface and learn about that. Well, these aren't my words. These are words from Steve Yantis' lab, where he did rapid event-related fMRI in humans as we were publishing our results. And why are the category reset cells domain independent? That's because any object can shut the same set of cells off, and once disinhibited, it can shut off any invariant category in IT anterior. So this is a crucial marker if you want to test and possibly disconfirm what I'm saying. Well, how do we know where to look next? Why don't our eyes jump around randomly? How does the brain know how to scan salient features of objects? And how do scanning movements occur within an object even before an object category is defined, as they must in order to learn an invariant object category? Well, whatever else you might believe, I think you'll agree that movement targets during directed search are chosen after the brain stage where surface representations get separated from each other by figure ground separation. Because if they're not separated yet, they're just one big blob, and you can't focus on one or the other. So you got to know something about figure ground separation, and fortunately I did. And one reason I did is because boundaries and surfaces are complementary. And you need to ask, how is a consistent percept created from complementarity and I predicted back in 94 that feedback between the V2 boundary and surface streams ensures perceptual consistency. And then to my great delight, I could see that it also initiates figure ground separation for free. And explain to, let me explain a ton of data about that. So what is the picture here? You're in V2, object boundaries are gating the filling in of object surfaces but you're trying to create consistency with feedback. The feedback is determined by 
a contrast sensitive on center of surround network that is going to be sensitive to the boundary of a filled in region. This boundary is called a surface contour. It strengthens the good boundaries that created good surfaces, inhibits other boundaries, and that triggers figure ground separation. I can't tell you more about this, but you might say, well, why the hell should I believe you? Well, there are many reasons, but my facade theory explains all the V2 data, the physiological data from multiple experiments about figure ground properties from the lab of Rudiger van der Heide. I predicted most of the data, but I explained it all this past year. So that's a marker. But now, because of this, because this is a contrast-sensitive on-center or surround net, it's more active at salient features. And so you can take a parallel path, compute salient features, and now pick off the most active salient feature as the next target position, which can elicit a saccade. OK, so in this way, while you pay attention, you run down these salient features, keeping you looking in the object, as has been shown psychophysically. Each of the target positions acts like a shift of attention, attention point as has been shown psychophysically. It has to happen after V2. I believe now it happens in V3A because people like Kaplowitz and C have written neurons within V3A process continuously moving contour curvature as a trackable feature. That's what I just explained to you. But in addition, this target position signal is much more rapidly updating a gain field that converts the retinotopic surface to a head-centered attentional shroud that's invariant under eye movement, so it can keep the category reset cells uh, from being uh, uh, in inadvertently turned on while you're scanning the surface. So this picture, if you carry it out, starts to unify spatial and object attention, figure ground separation. This is called predictive remapping and visual search. Well, why is a surface route generated between V4 and parietal cortex? I have to not tell you a lot of evidence, but I'll claim that V4 generates a sufficiently complete and stable visual representation upon which looking and reaching movements can be based. And then these resonating signals propagate top-down to V2 and V1 and bottom-up to prefrontal cortex using the art matching rule to select consistent information and suppress inconsistent information so that only information that can support effective decisions and actions remains. In particular, V4, I predict, completes 3D figure ground separation of the unoccluded parts of opaque surfaces, and these surfaces are what we consciously see. So you're resolving a design tension between recognition and seeing. You can recognize a partially occluded object even though you don't see it. So the intuitive idea here is if all occluding objects were visible, then they'd look, then everything would look transparent. You'd have a lot of problems learning what to reach. So V2 gives you these completed representations that are amodal. V4 gives you visible representations of the unoccluded surfaces. And so conscious seeing, I claim, lights up the visual representations in V4 that should be used to compute I and R movements. And that's what I mean when I say seeing to reach. It's an extra degree of freedom that lets the brain know what representations are useful. Why should you believe it? Well, we've simulated a ton of visual data about individual conscious representations, the, psych the psychophysics, the anatomy and neurophysiology. There's a lot of V2 data, physiological and V4 data that are consistent. But of course, I'd like more focused experiments because people weren't thinking like this. Now I want to, in my last few minutes, explain clinical data using surface shroud resonances. So let's look at parietal visual neglect. So you know, if you cut a party parietal cortex, you might not dress that side of your body. You might not draw that part of the world. And in a way, it's obvious if you don't have parietal cortex, you don't have surface shroud resonance. But there are many subtle 
data about the effect of lesions in inferior parietal lobule. And let me just run through some of them. Head-centered shroud coexists with retinotopic surface qualia, is shown by how neglect varies with a patient's direction of gaze. Competition for visual attention across parietal cortex is shown by how neglect varies with isolated versus simultaneous cues. Preserved figure ground segmentation during neglect is shown by how grouping can overcome neglect. Unconscious processing of neglected object identity, this difference between seeing versus knowing, is shown by implicit knowledge of neglected stimuli. So we need to understand there's a seeing surface shroud resonance into the wear stream, a knowing feature category resonance into the watt stream. They can synchronize so you can see something and know something about it at the same time. Um, a link between visual neglect and motor planning deficits, the seeing to reach. There are abnormal motor biases. These lesions lead to deficits in sustained visual tension. Well, there's no surface shroud resonance to maintain the tension. If you knock out the what stream knowing resonance, then you get visual agnosia. You can get reaching without knowing, as in the famous patient DF of Mel Gadol and his colleagues. You can explain many other things. Let me just make a comment about visual crowding to show why I think Christoph was wrong. What is visual crowding? Visual crowding is about the following. Let's say I look at these letters T, and they're of a size and spacing that I can see and recognize the middle T. And if I expand the size and spacing as I go to the periphery to respect the cortical magnification factor, I can still see and recognize them. But if I just take this and move it out there, then what happens is all of the T's get covered by one shroud. And if they don't have their own shroud, you can't see or recognize them, QET. So there are these other four resonances I wish I could tell you about. I can't. I did talk a little about these three on Monday. But I hope I've at least interested you in looking at my paper with the title of this talk. It's open access. It's on my web page. This kind of thinking has helped me to explain thousands of facts that I can't explain any other way. And if you're interested in understanding how things work in the brain, explaining data is really a primary activity. So I hope I've interested you enough to read the paper. If you have questions, I'm just Steve at BU, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Thank you for your sustained attention. Thank you so much, Professor Grossberg. Um, we have time for some questions, and I'll invoke uh, the uh, chair privilege and ask the first question. Um, Ray Kurzweil suggests that we can build a mind by stacking up these kinds of modules that you are describing at this basic level in things like visual uh, perception and recognition. So what I'm curious, um, you talked about knowing, and we've, uh, your work um, inspiring bio, uh, neural networks in computers from these biological neural networks suggests that we can have these recognition uh, modules about knowing. Do you think that the same kind of of um, center surround um, comparison works for abstract knowing, and how might that work? Or do we have to look for something different once we get beyond the visual object perception idea? Okay, well, first, I, I don't like the word modules. Okay. Uh, because in classical computer science and AI, that usually implies independent modules. These are anything but. Everything here is linked together with complementary interactions modulated by top-down interactions. Yes. So the hard thing is, is that I believe the functional unit is a pair of complementary cortical processing streams. That's a large distributed unit. So we can't talk about modules. 
Now, obviously, the point of my example of the visual agnosia was yes. that this was a very simple boxology cause. What are you going to do in 35 yeah. minutes? Um, but I summarized something that took Mel a book to explain. Yes. And because even knowing the difference between seeing and knowing and understanding the underlying laws, which I haven't written out for you today. Yes. I've shown you pictures, but there's 60 years of research backing it up. Of course. That you get a huge compression of the understanding of data. Like what I did with the visual neglect. I couldn't mention auditory neglect or why they have similar properties, but in an hour talk, I would have easily done that. And then you would have understood stream sh uh, resonances. Is this finished? No. Do we have to elaborate things? Well, if you look at a real art model for recognition, it's not a box. Yes. It's a whole, you know, a good part of the brain. So have I at least touched on the spirit of your question? Well, so what I'm thinking about is abstract qualities of things. I like Bartlett pairs, so does the, my liking of the Bartlett pair affect these systems the in some way? The pair? I'm sorry. I the Bartlett pair. You, you showed, I like Bartlett's more than Andrew's, so if I like yeah. that, am I going to recognize it well, better? Well, I haven't <laughs> explained everything, Okay. but I hope that I've given a foundation for people interested in things that are linked to this, that will accelerate their work. That's what progress is. And we are so inspired. A question? One question here first. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. I like your idea of stacked up resonances. But of, one of, of the, the what? I'm sorry, the echo. I have, I have low, low normal hearing because of years of steroids for asthma, so bear with me. Is the, is the summer relationship between the very high coherence which is so what, could you come forward and yes sir. I, I, is I the, hear you but it's so resonant I, is there some relationship between yeah. the very high coherence which is found in self-organized criticality yeah. which occurs throughout the cortex right. very long-range coherence yeah. and these stacks of resonances that you were well, talking well well remember I mentioned that the link between um, attention and synchrony uh, that's related to gamma oscillations, for example, if that's what you mean. I actually was the first person to talk about synchronous oscillations in 76 in my first art paper. I talked about order-preserving standing waves, which meant that if a feature was important at one time, it's important at all times, as opposed to a traveling wave like in a grand mal. And I taught that to Wolf Singer. And then Eckhorn read my 76 papers. So those are the two big labs that started the avalanche of studies of synchronous oscillations, including gamma oscillations. So yes, this is about synchronous oscillation. But you know, in our work, there are also contributions to understanding the link between gamma and beta, theta. You know, so. And you shouldn't go crazy about gamma because there can be more than one functional substrate for gamma. And gamma doesn't always have to be identical frequency, nor does beta. That's why some people say, is it alpha, is it beta? You know, they overlap in frequency. So yeah, it's all about that. And if you look in my paper in 2008 with Max Versace, we talk about how you get gamma oscillations as an emergent property when you get a good enough match in an art system, and when the mismatch is too great, you get slower beta oscillations. And at least four laboratories have since confirmed the prediction about the role of beta. Bob Desimone's lab, Earl Miller's, Bob Desimone in V1, Earl Miller in V4, um, a colleague, I see his face, I can't remember his name, in uh, learning hippocampal play cells, and then Rolf Sima, in V1 again in uh, uh, Amsterdam. So that might not be the be all and end all, but it is uh, something to hold on to, to push against new data. But you don't build in gamma. It comes out of the wash. OK. All right. So. Um so you, you, you placed the, the, the neglect, you, you explained neglect, visual neglect, in reference to V4, right? 
No, IPL. IPL, but you localize it. I you mean IPL interacting region. with prescribed visual cortex, right. The but it's the IPL lesion. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that go wrong depend on the nature of the lesion in IPL. Okay. Let me, let me with the recent look, I realize, wait, let me go back so the maybe data I... data is, so there's a very nice review by Corbetta on this, for a year ago, and the clinical data really points to a frontal parietal network disturbance. A what? A frontal parietal network disturbance. That's the oh, clinical I data. Oh, I believe right? in that. Okay, I so how does that then relate to your view? I believe in a frontal parietal network, and okay. in fact, but it depends on his experiment. For example, uh, let me, uh, so wait, I got to shift gears here. So, um, uh, for example, let's say that there are a lot of locations bidding for you to move your eyes or something like that. Um, we showed how um, you need a frontal parietal resonance to select one uh, in order to make a movement decision as it also opens basal ganglia gate. And those two aspects, the frontal parietal and the frontal basal ganglia, were both at least consistent with data collected shortly thereafter from Earl Miller's lab. So I would have to know the context of the result you're talking about to know what I should say or think. If you send me a link and tell me about what you were asking, I could write back if I know anything about it or it's incompatible with what I'm saying. It's a summary of the clinical literature on visual neglect. Yeah, it's well... Like Corbetta. I'll send it to you, no problem. Okay, well, I would have to... S I, I think there is a frontal parietal link, but, but that doesn't mean that the things that I'm explaining uh, are rate limitingly explained by the frontal parietal aspect of it. Because what I just showed you is if you just look at the parietal aspect, you can, the parietal aspect and how it interacts with vision, with visual cortex, can explain a lot of this data. So I would have to see, I haven't read that paper, so please send it to me and, and I'll look forward to studying it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gross, Grossberg. And now we have Dr. George Nortoff from the University of Ottawa with a temporal spatial theory of consciousness. Dr. Nortoff. <laughs> Hello, thank you for inviting. Um, so I provide you a view from the brain imaging view and it is somewhat complementary to the previous view. I start with the uh, sort of a question, what is the brain? Um, not rather than how it operates, but what is the brain? Because I think that our model of brain is a central question. Some of you may know this uh, movie, it's worth downloading. Um, and the question I don't need to tell you, this is really how does this gray matter uh, transform uh, the neuronal activity transform into uh, mental activity? And the way I formulate that question has already an important hint. Uh, I do not try to map mental activity upon neuronal activity, uh, but I try to come from the neuronal uh, side and see what is in there. Um, I start with a uh, typical model of the brain. It's really often considered like a car, so meaning uh, the more you push the gas pedal, the stronger, uh, the faster the car goes. So this is a pure mechanical relationship. The stronger you push, uh, the faster the car goes. And in a way, this is very similar to the way we conceive, sorry, uh, the way we conceive the brain, because we put in the uh, uh, stimuli, we give certain tasks, uh, we stimulate, we give stronger, we uh, give weaker stimuli, and then on the other side, is there a pointer somewhere? Excuse me, is there a laser pointer somewhere? Okay. Yeah, so you see on the right, so on the left you see the Colosseum from Rome, and uh, that's sort of a typical stimuli, particularly in brain imaging, often we use that. And then, um, oh yeah, this. 
Okay, so this is the, huh? where is the point? It's not working. Okay, doesn't, doesn't matter. I can, so here on the right, you see the, uh, um, or here on the very left, here on the very uh, right, uh, you see the uh, task evoked activity or stimulus induced activity. And usually it is considered that this activity is directly related to the stimulus itself. So that means there's a sufficient relation between the stimulus or the task you give and the stimulus induced activity. However, that leaves open how consciousness or other mental features like self come into the uh, game here because they do not come with a stimulus. And I think this is a central question, and so that leaves a gap. However, there have been alternative models. Uh, brain is not like a car. So imagine your car is continuously moving uh, back and forth. There's no driver in there. I think the Google cars cannot produce this yet. Um, so it's constantly moving back and forth in certain spatial temporal tra uh, trajectories. A certain spatial temporal pattern. You step out of here, you see your car constantly moving back and forth. And this is exactly what the brain does. Um, so meaning the brain has a strong, spontaneous, intrinsic activity. That by itself has been a lot researched uh, in previous years, particularly in brain imaging. However, we don't really know the role and function uh, of this spontaneous activity and why the brain invests so much energy, uh, uh, more than 80% of its energy budget, into it. And then the picture looks slightly different. With your spontaneous activity in the middle by the orange line, you approach the stimulus. What we then see as stimulus or task evoked activity is a hybrid or a mixture between the spontaneous activity and the stimulus. And this hybrid nature, this interaction between resting state or spontaneous activity and stimulus, we haven't understood at all. There a couple of papers usually is assumed as a purely additive uh, interaction of linear superposition. However, more recent results argue against it. The claim of my talk that this spontaneous activity has a certain spatial temporal structure pattern which is necessary for consciousness. That's why we, uh, this is the title of my talk, uh, and this is really uh, also the uh, temporal spatial theory of consciousness. So the idea is here that we look into the way how the brain itself, how the brain itself and its spontaneous activity construct time and space, temporal and spatial feature, and how those surface in different dimensions of consciousness. It has strong philosophical implications, which I do not spell out here, uh, which um, uh, can be spelled out in a different way. So the way the main thesis here is really that the way the brain constructs time and space transforms into phenomenal or mental features, meaning this is an often uh, important philosophical side remark that mental or phenomenal features are spatial temporal. Philosophers often consider them as non-spatial temple uh, because that goes back to Descartes. Um, so the idea is uh, that there is a set of spatial temporal mechanism or temporal spatial mechanism by the brain's spontaneous activity. And here I present you some of them. Uh, here the, the first one is uh, temporal spatial nestedness. I will go into more detail. And these different spatial temporal mechanisms are associated with different dimensions of consciousness. As you know, uh, one of the main problems in the current uh, neuroscience of consciousness is really uh, that the different dimensions of consciousness, like the level state is usually assumed, content, then there are phenomenal features, cognitive features, that they're not really integrated, uh, how they're linked. Uh, and different models are used for different um, um, uh, uh, dimensions of consciousness. There is some recent attempt by uh, Antonio Huditz uh, and uh, uh, Bachmann to sort of link the content and the level of uh, level state of consciousness. So I will uh, present you now uh, in the following. First, before going into some of these mechanisms, I briefly want to say what do I mean by time and space. 
So by time and space, I do not mean the time and space which we observe at one particular point in time and space, as we do as an outside observer. But time and space means that, for instance, the brain constructs its own spatial matrix. So I'm here on a functional level where the brain cons can construct, for instance, functional connectivity, and that yields a certain topological organization. Much of that has been, for instance, discussed in the small world uh, uh, features uh, by Olof Spons and, and others, and however, there are also more complex ways of analyzing these data. Um, so that's one way, uh, the functional connectome, how to construct uh, a space. Uh, my talk will mainly focus on time. In time, you have different frequencies. Uh, I just give you here an uh, example, typical here, gamma was already mentioned, faster frequencies, beta, alpha, uh, theta, uh, delta, and these are the frequencies which are uh, classically studied uh, with EEG, and the focus is mainly on the higher frequencies, gamma, beta, because there, and there was a long, as you all know very well, there was a discussion about whether gamma is a sufficient con condition of consciousness, neural correlate of consciousness. However, my focus will be more on the very slow frequencies. So I'm here, and you go to the bottom of that picture, in the frequency range between 0.01 hertz and 0.1 hertz. Why do I, I'm interested in these very slow frequencies? For two reasons. First, they have much more power than the faster frequencies. I will show you in the next slide, they follow, follow a power uh, law distribution, and so they have much more power. And that ultimately means if something has more power, it must be functionally more relevant. It must have a very basis function. And the second, you see here in, indicated in that, that these uh, infraslow frequencies have very long cycle durations. For instance, here the 0.01 hertz has a cycle duration of 100 seconds. That means 50 seconds high excitability, 50 seconds low excitability. And that means these are periods where different stimuli can be integrated. The assumption is that, as you know, consciousness, if you want to say so, perception always goes beyond the single stimuli. I think this is very, with your adaptive resonance uh, theory, very well incompatible. You see much more than just the simple stimuli. You see this, uh, different other stimuli, you link them temporally, you link them in space. And that maybe these long cycle durations uh, are essential for integrating and putting things together, or if you want to say so, what was discussed in the visual domain as binding. Yeah. So, uh, next uh, slide. However, these different frequencies do not just stand side by side. They are very intertwined. There's a certain complex organizations which we haven't really fully understood yet. And my uh, um, focus is on this complex organization. There was a question before whether these are modules. And the and same way here, my answer to that question is exactly the same as yours, meaning, no, it's far away from being module. If there were modules, we had not consciousness. I'm very clear about this. What you need, you need this, what we call module, integrated in a complex overall organization. And one of those features I want to point out here is nestedness. So these different frequencies are somewhat nested within each other. My classical model is the Russian dolls. You see, different, you see the large Russian doll from the outside. You open, have another Russian doll. You have another Russian doll. You have another Russian doll. And from the shape of the small Russian doll, you can somewhat predict the shape of the larger Russian doll. How? Somewhat. But they're somewhat integrated with each other and they shape an overall organization. And I bet that the same you could probably say for the different visual cortex, the complex hierarchy model, where you had the uh, model by Van Essen, that ultimately that amounts to a spatial, and I would argue a temporal spatial nestedness. So you could investigate the different frequency pattern. So when we speak here of temporal nestedness, I mean that you have a certain organization you see in the lower left, uh, you see that the, the lower the frequency, uh, the higher the power. The faster the frequency, the lower the power. If you do a, uh, and that amounts to a scale-free or invariant uh, uh, organization and a long-term auto-range correlation. 
And I will show you, so there's a certain temple nestedness, and that also goes with special, uh, with a certain special distribution, a certain special nestedness, that maybe sensory regions are sort of like the Ru a smaller Russian doll, whereas, let's for instance, the default mode network might be the larger Russian doll. And both also differ probably in the spatial, uh, in the temple features. So I come back to this, and I would argue that leads me basically to my first mechanism of consciousness, spatial temple mechanism of consciousness, that the temple nestedness is central for the level of consciousness. What I mean by level, the level or state of consciousness uh, when you're basically just, you, you zip into sleep, your level decreases. And important that this level is not static. There's a fluctuation to it. It continuously fluctuates. You will see why I emphasize that. So, um, uh, Antonio Houdet, and here you see, when you go into the detail of the slide, or you can see this in, in our paper, um, that um, at the, again, within the nestedness, there are different tempo spatial mechanisms. One is, for instance, what Antonio Houdet described, a dynamic repertoire, I will come back to that. Another one is, for instance, cross-frequency coupling, which I will not go into detail here. Um, let me uh, show you some data of ours. So these are data from uh, patients in vegetative state who lost their consciousness. And here, we basically were probing uh, what can be called the dynamic repertoire. So we investigated neuronal variability. Here, very on the, uh, on the first one, the amplitude of low frequency fluctuations is basically the root mean square of the amplitude. This is neuronal variability. And you can, and we also, and this is important, we investigate this in different frequency ranges in the infraslow range. So the first one is the whole, uh, the classical for fMRI band pass 0.01 to 0.1 hertz. Then you have slow five. This is very slow. This is between 0.1 hertz and 0.027. And then slow four is between uh, 0.027 and 0.073. You don't need to know this. Just uh, keep in mind, uh, slow five is a very slow, I like to call this, is a temple basement, and it has the strongest power. And you can see, uh, also interestingly on the side, I don't want to go into detail, it's mainly in the uh, cortical midline regions where the vegetative patients uh, differ from each other. Then here, it's particularly the variability, you see again a lot of posterior cortical midline regions, some anterior midline regions. And interestingly, when you look into the healthy brain, it is these regions where you have the strongest power in the infraslow frequencies. Whereas in the sensory regions, you have less power in the uh, infraslow frequency, meaning your power law uh, is less strong uh, in uh, sensory regions, probably because they're con constantly interrupted by the high frequency input from the environment. So they have no time to develop their infraslow frequencies. Um, then, and here you can see also a certain uh, frequency specificity. This is the perigenal anterior cingulate cortex, medial prefrontal. Uh, and you can see they have a specific deficit in the very slow infrafrequency range, in slow five. So meaning your dy the dynamic repertoire, the variability in these regions is highly impaired. Meaning, in a, a figurative sense, that here's the largest Russian doll, the, or the basement, the temple basement, uh, let's say, of the brain or of the house, is basically weakened. The fundament is weakened here. Yeah? Uh, here you see the same for posterior cingulate cortex. And here we actually investigated, these are data from anesthesia. So here we investigated the temporal spatial distribution of the power law exponent. Power law exponent, I told you, sort of the, the, the power spectrum, the relationship between the different uh, frequencies, between faster and uh, slower ones. And you can see here, and this basically throughout the whole brain, you see the upper is the healthy subject, the medium is the anesthesia subject, and the uh, lower of the images is the difference images. And what is interesting, when you see in the very lower left, the graph, we plotted the power spectrum according to slow five and slow four, and you see that particular, the slow five, you see the lower curve, which is basically flat, are the anesthesia people, uh, and the, the, the steep curve is the healthy subject. And it is particular in slow five. So it's really, imagine if the floor in this room sort of gets weaker, there's a high danger that everything crumbles. 
And that exactly seems to be here, because the, the slow fives, the temple basement, is weaker, and all the other frequencies do not have such a strong fu fundament, meaning in terms of the Russian dolls, there's a likelihood that the smaller dolls just crack through the uh, biggest doll because it's no longer stable. Um, you can see a high difference. Uh, the other interesting thing is here, what we investigated, this is important for the interpretation also, that uh, here on the left, you see basically the distribution of different uh, scale-free values in different voxels of the brain. You see the, the, the brown, the, the, on the, on the, uh, so you see the graph on the left and you see the brown part of it. This is basically the, the, the distribution of different scale-free values across different regions in the brain. You see quite a distribution, so there's a certain range. Whereas when you see then the blue thing, this is an anesthesia, you see a much more limited distribution. So what does this now mean for consciousness? The idea of the temporal spatial theory of consciousness is that the basic idea that temporal, speech, uh, temporal spatial features of neuronal activity transform into corresponding temporal spatial features on the level of consciousness for different dimension of consciousness. So how do I make that point? So here, on the left, you see the frequency pattern, you see a certain temporal spatial nestedness. The assumption is that, that those time scales on the left transform into corresponding time scales on the level of consciousness. So that your temporal spatial nestedness on the level of the neuronal spontaneous activity transforms if there is enough range, if there is a sufficient temporal range and a sufficient complexity of organization, meaning it is not enough just to have two Russian dolls uh, in one big one. You must have at least 10 or 21. Yeah? And the big Russian doll, which you see from the outside, must have a certain power and stability, because otherwise the whole thing breaks down. Uh, and this is what I indicated here. That's why I said, remember, when I said level or state of consciousness must have certain fluctuations. Uh, there are certain fluctuations, there's a spontaneous organization. So now, this is the range of your frequencies and your power, the distribution in the healthy subject in anesthesia or in vegetative state or in sleep, uh, you have a much smaller range. And that means it breaks down. At some point, there's a certain level where, you, where your level of, or state of consciousness breaks down. And obviously, this is particularly engineered by the very slow frequencies. Uh, slow five, we have other findings which are uh, in revision, uh, where we really show that it's the, it's the slow five, if the slow five, the very slow frequency uh, is significantly decreased in power, then you have a high likelihood of losing your consciousness. So, uh, I come to the uh, next uh, mechanism of consciousness. I want to give you another example from our research. So, this is here, the temporal spatial alignment. As you know, that consciousness is not, and this is, I think, often neglected in the debate, consciousness is not, is not in, the, in, in your head. Um, I think this is a major mistake from philosophers. Uh, consciousness is really, it puts you as part of the world. Yeah? Uh, you yourself perceive the object in relation to the object as part of the wider world. So the question, so meaning, first you have access to the wider temporal spatial scale of the world. Then the question is, how does the brain allows you to access, which is more limited temporal spatial scale, to access and relate to that temporal spa spatial scale beyond its own in the world? And I think this and this is not just uh, a matter of representation. What I'm talking here is not about representation, because that means in here. I think this, what consciousness is, is not about the representation of the world. It is becoming part of yourself and linking and relating to the world. This ultimately is very uh, well compatible with the dynamical approach. So I show you an example from our research on psychiatry. So originally, I'm a... Uh, Psychiatrist. So here we investigated the uh, bipolar patients. Bipolar patients suffer from either mania, they're very happy, or from depression, they're extremely sad. And they have these extreme much mood fluctuations. And one of the features is that in depression, you're some, in both 
extremes, you're somewhat out of tune with the world. In depressed, when you ask these patients, everything is extremely slow. Their inner time, plotted here on the x-axis, is extremely slow. Whereas in mania, it's the opposite. Everything is extremely fast. Yeah? Uh, they're extremely fast. When you speak a manic patient, she or he will not sit here for a minute and just walk around and, and because so fast, speed up. And obviously, for the depressed patients, uh, they too slow for the external world. The mania is too fast. This is what I try to plot here. So they somewhat desynchronize. Then when you have too slow inner time, then your external time from the world, you experience everything is too fast. I recently had a patient who said uh, she knows that her mother doesn't speak much faster as usual, but she perceives this as too fast so she cannot follow, so she doesn't speak anymore. Because her inner time was too slow. And when your inner time is too slow, you compare it to the outer time, and that's then way too fast. And then, of course, everything is stressful. The reverse in mania. For the manic patients, the inner time is so fast that the time of the world is way too slow. We are just too slow for the manic patients. If we were faster, then the manic patient would be normal. Yeah? So we wouldn't uh, say this. Um, so basically, and that's what I try to indicate here, on the very left, in that slide, on the very left, you see the, the, the blue upward arrow, you see that's the inner time. If that is too fast, uh, then your outer, if that is accelerated, the upper part, then you experience the outer uh, time as too slow. And that's exactly what these patients tell you. And the opposite in depression. So now the question, so these are sort of experiential, is inner time consciousness, uh, if you want to say the phenomenology of time. So now how is that related to the brain's construction of time? Because the assumption is here that maybe in depression the, the brain constructs the time as too slow, the brain's time. So now the question, how can we me measure the brain's time speed? Because this is about time speed. So for that, we investigated neuronal variability. So it basically describes the degree of change in your brain's activity. Um, and we investigated this in two different networks. It is from the time perception literature, well-known inner time perception that the somatomotor network is related to inner time. So that left open the question for outer time. So we assume that sensory networks, that's where the external stimuli are processed, and the visual, for instance, the visual network has an intrinsic spontaneous activity. So and that's where the external stimulus first encounters the spontaneous activity. If that spontaneous activity is too fast or too slow, then you process and perceive that stimulus as too fast or too slow. So this is exactly what we did, and we did this uh, investigations in these networks. You see, uh, let me just see here on the uh, uh, upper, on, on the uh, left, you see a certain balance. On the left, you see the red ones are the healthy subjects, and you see there's almost quite balanced between the two networks in neuronal variability, whereas in the uh, uh, depression, um, the somatonode network, which stands for inner time, is, has not enough variability. So you don't have much neuronal change, meaning you experience your inner time. There is not much speed of change, so your time speed neuronally is too slow, whereas in visual cortex is too fast. And that goes very well with what these patients experience. The inner time is too slow, everything external is too fast. In mania, you see the ratio is exactly the opposite. Uh, it's the uh, the uh, somato network is much faster relative to the uh, visual network. And what is important is really here the, the balances, it's the ratio. It's not the one network alone. Again, there's a certain organization. And you see uh, the healthy on the left is, a, is, is sort of an average in a continuum between different possible values. Then we plotted the ratio in neuronal variability between somato network and uh, visual cortex, uh, visual network, and you can see that the uh, depressed, um, here the, uh, the manic and the uh, depressed showed extreme values, and the healthy subjects were in between. So 
what does this tell us? Uh, here in the controls, you see on the x-axis plotted somato network, uh, somato motor network, visual network, neuronal variability. They're somewhat a balance. Uh, on the y-axis, you see the inner time consciousness uh, acceleration or retardation. Uh, and you can see there's a certain balance. In depression, uh, there is too slow inner time, outer time on the right, the visual network is uh, too fast. So you see this uh, disbalance, and basically that your inner time is no longer aligned to the outer time. Yeah? So you're sort of out of tune. So there's a temporal spatial alignment. And that, of course, has major consequences. Because then, if everything is too fast for you in the outside world, also you have cognitive problems. These are the, the logical consequence of that the external input is relatively processed too fast to the inner time. And then you have all kinds of affective cognitive disturbances, and these uh, disbalances also predicted the symptoms, which I didn't mention here. For mania, it's exactly the opposite. The inner time is too fast, the outer time is too slow. So I think that gives you what we call a temporal spatial alignment, that you're in tune or out of tune uh, with the time and space of the uh, world. So it's ultimately a relation between the intrinsic time and space of the brain and the time and space of the world. Um, this leads to this picture, more generally said, that your brain is an intrinsic part and which is important that consciousness uh, makes possible that we experience ourselves as part of the time and space in the world. And that is possible by the way the brain constructs time and space. Um, I briefly come to the last mechanism. I will keep that a little bit shorter for the sake of, I still have a couple of minutes, uh, time. And this is, of course, the uh, $100 million question. How do phenomenal features arise in consciousness? Uh, and I think this is the question which is also for philosophy central. So here, uh, what we assume is a, what we call the temporal spatial expansion. Let me show a little bit of our own data. I showed you the vegetative state patient data. Here, uh, in addition to resting state, we also did task evoker activity, and we did this with uh, self-related stimuli, own versus other names, because we have a lot of research going on with the self, and particularly the cortical midline structures, uh, and we presented self and non-self-related uh, questions. This was done in China. That's why we asked for uh, Beijing. Um, it's one minute, 60 seconds. That's everywhere in the world at least you would assume, have you, that's sort of a non-self-related question, have you been to Beijing is a self-related one. Um, first, we checked whether there is really, whether the subjects really process the stimuli. Uh, we could see in auditory cortex, we could see quite fair activations in almost all subjects. Then uh, we looked, uh, we compared the healthy group versus the vegetative state patients, and we could uh, see significant activity differences, in particular anterior cortical midline structures, perigenal cingulate cortex, posterior cingulate cortex. Uh, I don't want to go into detail, but here what was uh, important for us, does, you remember you have seen the resting state uh, abnormalities, in particular neuronal variability, do these changes predict the uh, altered uh, task evoked activity. And that's a central question. That's exactly what we showed here. You see on the x-axis the degree of task evoked activity. On the y-axis the, uh, neuronal, uh, the neuronal variability in the resting state. And you could see the more variable you are in the resting state, the higher your task evoked activity. And even more interesting, the degree of task evoked activity, self, non-self differentiation, predicted your level of consciousness. Whereas the resting state activity itself did not predict the level of consciousness. What do we make out of this? On the neuronal side, the first thing which we need to consider is how does the resting state interact with the stimulus such that uh, consciousness can be associated with the stimulus? And these mechanisms, purely neuronal level, we haven't understood. The classical model is an additive uh, linear superposition model. However, a very clever po uh, former postdoc of mine, Zhu Rui Huang, showed in an extensive study uh, that there is really a non-additive interaction. This was done in fMRI in the infraslow level. We have now currently ECOG and cellular data where we show the same 
in different frequencies. So it really seems if you investigate it in the right way and don't average out the pre stim difference, the pre stimulus differences, that you really get a non additive model. Why do I emphasize this? Because we assume that by having a non additive interaction, that the single stimulus point in time gets expanded and integrated into the much larger frequency and spatial range of the brain. So meaning, having the, the small Russian doll by integrated into the larger Russian doll, the smaller Russian doll gets expanded in a, in a virtual way, if you want to say so. And this expansion, this virtual expansion, is central for phenomenal features. And it can occur in different ways, different spatial configuration, which probably might be related to different phenomenal features like qualia intentionality. So, how uh, uh, phenomenal features, for me, they are spatial temporal features, and they are a going beyond. Buzaki, it's a very nice expression that perception goes beyond. However, he doesn't specify the beyond. I would argue that this beyond consists in a spatial temporal extension of the spatial temporal features of the stimuli. And that spatial temporal uh, extension is strongly engineered, has its basis in the spatial temporal structure of the stimuli. So we are currently investigating whether the scale-free properties of the resting state predict the task-evoked activity. So meaning your smaller Russian doll must be properly integrated within the larger Russian doll for both to be assigned, for the, former, for the large, for smaller one to be assigned with consciousness. So we really need to look much uh, deeper. So and that's basically uh, uh, to the end. And I think that also provides a key to how the brain works, because we really haven't really understood. I'm sure this is very well compatible with uh, uh, dynamical approaches, um, and ultimately also uh, sheds a new light on psychotic symptoms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nortov. <laughs> um, and, and Stuart, uh, we'll, we'll give you the chair's privilege of having the first question. Stuart, thank you very much. Thank you very, right, thank you very much. Have you considered uh, extending your nested multiscalar hierarchy even smaller and faster inside the neuron? We know that microtubules, for example, have coherent uh, temporal dynamics and smaller uh, in terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz. And Roger Penrose and I have suggested that beat frequencies at that level actually give rise to the EEG. So you, you, know, you, you had EEG going as fast as uh, gamma, 100 hertz, let's say. But if you go faster to 1,000, to a million, to a billion, to a trillion, you get down to the uh, cytoskeletal dynamics. So I would, I would suggest that you're Russian dials go much, much smaller and much, much faster inside the neuron. Um, yes and no. Um, <laughs> um, and it's not a diplomatic escape. Uh, it's a real answer. Yes, uh, because certainly you have to consider the whole temporal range. And meaning if you have a, these uh, faster frequencies, you have a much more fine-grained uh, frequency range. It's much more complex. You have much more ways of organization. You have a much more higher uh, possible range of temple organization, meaning you have not only 20 Russian dolls in there, but 100. And that's good. That increases the likelihood of consciousness. However, this is where I'm not sure. I anticipated, because it's my own bias, why not going into the opposite direction, into the larger uh, frequency range? Because ultimately, when I uh, have my claim right, that really consciousness, we experience ourselves as part of the world, then I need to align the brain's frequencies with the much faster or slower frequency ranges of the world, for instance, with seismic earth waves. Yeah? That frequency range is not in our brain. And the question, how does that work? There's certain entrainment alignment data on this. And again, that extends the frequency range. So my answer to your question, the, my no is I do not think that that alone is sufficient, is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Because I think a sufficient condition, I would say, is the overall complex organization. 
When you look at data in anesthesia, in disorders of consciousness, there's still a lot of activity going on in these states, and one is surprised. But it is the way they are organized and structured. So it's not a single temple module, I would argue. Anesthesia acts at the terahertz range, however, but I'll, I'll let it go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. That was wonderful. If uh, it's possible, you put up a slide um, talking about depression and mania and their uh, <laughs> underproduction and overproduction. I assume you're um, familiar with the meta-analysis by Thones and Oberf Oberfeld from 2015. There was a meta-analysis that showed that potentially the judgments associated with uh, fast or slow mm -hmm. uh, subjective experience are not mapping on necessarily with depression. So they, they left open one window that was at shorter durations, people who are depressed may overproduce the duration at longer durations they might underproduce so there's no linear correlation between speed of experience and the speed of the internal clock right i was wondering how if how will you accommodate that within the model so it seems that they actually accelerate their clock not just relative to different parts sure. parts of the brain but over different intervals uh, sure so you can read in that paper um, we discussed the psychology. I mean, what you basically say is a psychological time perception experiment. And we try to link it to the uh, phenomenology. If they, let's say, over reproduce, perceive something as longer, then it is, I think it's very well compatible with inner time being slower. Yeah? Because if something is slower, we have that, uh, then of course you tend to perceive it as longer. Yeah? If your inner time is faster, you tend to perceive uh, something uh, correspondingly. Yeah? So if we discuss this in the paper that is quite well in accordance with the phenomenology of time. However, and I agree with that, how much uh, can we take objective validity to the experiential judgments? That's the second question, but they might be confounded by itself, exactly as you say, because the cognitive correlates are altered. Uh, hi, I uh, enjoyed the talk very much. I have uh, two questions here. here. Uh, uh -huh. okay. one, one question is, uh, because we have the oscillatory picture of the brain, but we also have the predictive coding picture of the brain, and whether hierarchically nested predictive coding somehow goes, goes well with the nested oscillations, that's the first question. Second has to do, you mentioned Bujaki, and, and, uh, which is reminiscent of temporal coding, and you know, theta precession and a rat that walks in a well-recognized maze. And there you get uh, basically cross-frequency phase locking between theta and gamma. And the question is, when it comes to the slowing down and the accelerating, maybe it's really how many gamma peaks do you have inside one theta cycle, and not so much the slowing. So I'm, I'm curious, do you think that you get more, theta, more gamma peaks for one theta cycle or less in the cases of slowing and accelerating? And it's a simple system to actually measure it. Measure. So, as I, I mean, it's what's difficult, the resonance here. Um, uh, the f main questions are first, predictive coding, and second, the faster frequency, what the role is. Correct. Okay, first, um, you see, mine is a dynamical approach, and I'm very much in accordance with the previous speakers here. It's not a content or information-based approach. I do think that what we call information or specific content result and are highly structured and organized by the underlying dynamical features. Psychiatric patients are a wonderful example of that. They perceive abnormal content because they seem to put them together in an abnormal temporally way. Yeah? Uh, if I, my time is too slow, my inner time, then I will, put, uh, will not be able to put certain things together which for you, when you discuss with me, are closely related with each other. So, and then, of course, I have an abnormal perception. Um, that's the first thing. So, predictive coding, definitely, I think, for the pre-stimulus, uh, we investigate a lot of pre-stimulus, or what they call predictive uh, inputs, uh, but I think it's a secondary consequence of the underlying dynamical features. And predictive coding, and I uh, uh, can't remember what his name was, he said it recently, it's not about a theory of consciousness. It's about a theory of contents, of cognition 
content, of cognitive content here. Yeah? And I think for that, it is brilliant. The problem is, again, they leave out the consciousness. The uh, second, the phenomenon, when I speak of consciousness, of course, I'm also a philosopher. I mean, particularly the phenomenal features of consciousness. Yeah? Um, second question for the faster frequencies. Um, certainly, I know it's a lot of data. I do think that the faster, if you want to have it in a nutshell, my argument, that the faster frequencies are important for the timing, for the exact timing at a conscious content at, at one point in time. Fine grained, that's very clear. Yeah? In that sense, you can consider them as sufficient for the timing of the contents of consciousness. However, that is not by itself sufficient and remains empty if you don't have the underlying necessary or predisposing conditions, as I like to say, neural predispositions, uh, the infraslow frequencies, because they provide the larger temple sch uh, scheme. So imagine you just have the very small Russian doll. You're, you basically almost neglect it. You will have no consciousness of it. If you integrate the, the small Russian doll within the larger one, then you have a much more impressive perception and you have consciousness. So, you know, I consider the uh, infraslow frequencies as a large Russian doll. However, if you take the large Russian doll without the smaller Russian doll, it's also empty. Yeah? So, they have to work together. Thank you very much, Dr. Norto. So yesterday we had the uh, fantastic genealogy in the language and consciousness session um, of Professor Chomsky. Uh, and today we have the uh, uh, intellectual grandchild of Roger Penrose um, through uh, his work with Stephen Hawking. And so I'd like to present uh, Dr. Philip Lowe, the CEO and founder of Neural Vigil Incorporated. Incorporated, uh, where he's going to be telling us about harnessing the brain's whispers from sleeping finches to Stephen Hawking to the International Space Station. Professor Law. Okay, is this on? Yep, terrific. All right, thank you very much, um, Eric. Thank you, Stuart. Thank, thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you to all the people who are supporting this great conference. Um, so I'm going to tell you about something a little bit different today, um, starting with this. So I was incarcerated in this building for a few years uh, during my PhD uh, in San Diego. And um, one of the first things I said when I, when I arrived, I spoke to three um, great uh, researchers. And I said, if, we, if animals are conscious, why do we anesthetize them? I mean, how can they feel pain if, they are, if they're not conscious? Um, and on the other hand, if, if they are conscious, you know, why should we, um, why should we use them? So I got three diff very different responses. One was, don't worry about this. This is a, a political um, issue. Uh, the other one was, um, w uh, we, we anesthetize them because we don't want it to move. Uh, and we don't want to think that they are, we are causing pain. And the third one was, obviously, they're conscious. Uh, and we may have to live with the consequences of working with them in this way. So um, I'd been invited by, by Francis Crick uh, to work with Terry Sanofsky, and before accepting this invitation, I worked for a year on these guys. Uh, do you know what these are? Yeah, zebra, fish, zebra finches, Australian finches. And there was a very interesting phenomenon that was discovered um, around 2000 when a graduate student by the name, by the name of uh, um, Amish Dave um, discovered the following things. So this here is a sonogram. So you have time on the x-axis, frequency uh, on the y-axis, power is uh, indicated in the light gradient. And uh, the song of the bird song is the, the composed in, a mo in motifs, which themselves are they composed into syllables. And of course, the birds don't sing A, B, C, D, but this is just a way for us to show that there is some um, repetition. And when the bird is awake, if you record from RA, Robustus Iacestratilis, which is a premodal nucleus, you can see that um, um, in a raster plot over here, uh, these, the neurons are responding in a very reliable way. The amazing thing that uh, Amish discovered is that when the bird was sleeping, even though there was a lot of spontaneous activity, which you see in this haze here, 
uh, you could see these lines, these vertical lines, showing that the neuron was responding again in a very similar way, even though the, the bird was not singing. It appeared as if the bird was replaying or replaying the song. So for those of you who don't know these plots, these are raster plots. Uh, whenever the neuron fires, we just put a dot, and we just run the trials, we stack them on top of, of, one, of one another, and um, when you see these lines over here, it means that pretty much the neuron is doing the same thing over time, trial by trial. Is that clear? Okay, good. Okay, so you might wonder why I'm showing you this, this, this painting over here. So when, when Amish discovered uh, this phenomenon, all of a sudden there was a competition between MIT, Caltech, and the lab at Chicago uh, to figure out in which state of sleep this was actually going on. And um, MIT and Caltech published their, their results and showed that in fact um, there was just slow wave sleep in these birds. There were no sleep stages per se. And I knew that they were wrong because if you actually um, base these birds in infrared light, and let them sleep longer, so 12 hours instead of eight, I could actually see with my little security camera that in fact the eyes were moving later on in the night and they didn't appear as if they were being uh, aroused. And so um, I, when I came here, I realized why everybody had failed. They were using the mammalian placement of electrodes uh, and applying this on birds when in fact birds don't have a neocortex. So we actually had to put electrodes very close one from the other on particular brain areas and see and find the location which would actually vary with the greatest um, uh, amount of anesthesia. So once I, I understood that, uh, I made a number of discoveries. I found REM sleep. I found a number of stages. The only problem is that um, there was no literature on this. And so I had to come up with an unsupervised way of looking at the data in order to, in fact, confirm that what I had discovered uh, was correct. So I went to see the head of the sleep lab at the University of Chicago, and I said, would you mind please uh, loaning me the algorithm that you use on humans? I'd love to just apply this on birds, see if there's any sort of uh, similarity, and, um, and, and go from there. And he said, no way. And I said, you know, this is for birds. I'm an alum. There's a very small market for birds. Um, I can use this uh, on a computer uh, in your laboratory, you know, not connected to the internet. And he said, no way. So, I, so he said, do you want to see the algorithm? I said, yes. So he said, he said okay, come by Tuesday at 2 o'clock. So I showed up Tuesday at 2 o'clock. He took me to a very elegant room with fellows and residents. Uh, and it looked like these fellows and residents never left the hospital since they actually were born. And they were looking at data, at raw data, EEG, EMG, EOG. And they were taking votes on this data. And after 15 minutes of taking these votes, I just thought maybe he just wants to show me how powerful he is that he can make very smart people do something very stupid for the long. <laughs> and so I sheepishly went back to him and I said, could you just show me where the algorithm is and I won't bother you. And he laughed, he said, son, this is the algorithm. So I couldn't believe this, you know, we were apparently at the beginning of this information revolution that we would do everything by hand. So I came back here uh, and I spoke to Francis Crick, I spoke to Terry Sinowski and I said, you know, uh, it's unbelievable that they all do this by hand. And I was told, yes, we know this. Maybe there aren't discrete sleep stages. Maybe sleep is a big continuum. And you should be very careful to not actually work on this problem because you may waste your PhD. So once they told me this, I knew I, I, I absolutely had to work on this problem. Uh, and I worked on it in secrecy for a few years. And then one day I took a sanity break, went to, to um, the Art Institute in Chicago, and I looked at this painting. And this painting is actually revolutionary because, so, so the original painting is uh, almost about the size of, of the, the projection here. And um, what Sora did is he pushed impressionism to an extreme and he replaced little strokes by tiny little dots. So he did pretty much the opposite of what the, uh, the Flemish painters did. And the idea, which is completely intuitive now, is that the statistical distribution of dots actually gives us defined features. So in other words, here you can see you have uh, a monkey, you have a, um, a dog, there's a hat, and so on. So, you know, I thought that's actually pretty interesting because, you know, unlike what you might think about your, your neighbors, your family members, your colleagues, the brain is not either on or off. It is a, a continuum. You have this, this big EEG. Is there a way to actually discretize this in little dots? It turns out it is possible. So here you have a spectrogram. These are eight hours or seven and a half hours of sleep in um, a finch. So where do you think that most of the power is, above or below the 20 hertz line? Below. The power is below. We agree on this. 
Where do you think the information is? I have one word for below. No, I agree. Oh, you said above, sorry. OK, so I have one word for above. above. Two votes for above. above. OK. Who doesn't think anything? <laughs> Perfect. So it turns out it's everywhere. Uh, if you just normalize the signal, you can see that all the way to 100 hertz, we can actually see uh, important stuff going on. What is nice about looking at the data this way is now we can go from a vector to a scalar at each time point and compute this, what I call this uh, preferred frequency map. Um, and so now at every time point, we choose the frequency which has the highest relative shift with respect to baseline at that given time. So this is sensitive. It picks up from 60 hertz in America and 50 hertz in, in Europe. Uh, but more importantly, we now don't have to assume anything about alpha, uh, theta, delta, et cetera. We can actually come up with our own um, um, frequency bands in each particular species. And so that means that we can go back now to the spectrogram and create a manifold where each brain state is going to have its own representation. So here you have a 2D cross-section uh, of a 3D manifold and every dot corresponds to three seconds of EEG collected one second at a time. In dark blue, you have slow wave sleep. In red, you have REM sleep. There are two perpendicular planes. And in the middle here, you have the subtle area, which is an intermediate sleep state. This was the first time that an intermediate sleep state had been discovered outside of mammals. Since then, it's also been discovered in, in reptiles. Um, this generalized very nicely in, in all of the, um, the animals in the study. And uh, the, the agreement rate between the human uh, and the algorithm at a th uh, three second resolution was over 80%, which was fun because humans tend to agree with one another only 75% of the time at a 30 second resolution. So this was actually you know, a, a pretty remarkable thing. But more importantly, what we were able to show is that in fact, um, if we, if we pull all of the data, slow wave sleep was decreasing in the birds, REM sleep was expanding in the birds, REM length was expanding, and the space between REM was decreasing. So this is textbook mammalian sleep. Uh, then the algorithm would actually tell you for each state what was the most representative epoch for that particular uh, night. So here you have three second vignettes, uh, and you have microvolts uh, on the y-axis. So this is EEG. So here we have slow wave sleep uh, with delta waves, REM sleep, the eyes are moving. Here there's an intermediate sleep state. There are no delta waves, and the eyes are not moving. Wakefulness over here. Here the right eye is open. The left hemisphere is awake. The left eye is closed. The right hemisphere is asleep. Some of you wish you could do this right now, but you can't because you have a, you have a corpus callosum, uh, which means you, are, you will either sleep from, with both hemispheres or, or be awake. And uh, this signal here, which was very, very curious, um, and it, it appeared all throughout the data, and I went back to the head of the sleep lab, and I said, we're seeing this. What is this? And he said, well, I didn't know that you were working on rats. I said, well, unless you think that birds are rats with feathers, I'm not. Um, he said, it's impossible because these are K-complexes, and they're produced by the interactions between the, the neocortex and, um, and the thalamus. So we did a double-blind study. Uh, we had one person who scored just these signals, uh, and then we had one person who scored just the video blindly. Uh, and out of 102 cases, there are only four out of 102 cases where there was a match. In other words, in 98 of 102 cases, these signals would appear, and they didn't appear to be caused by movement artifact. They appeared to be endogenous. This here is a human K-complex. OK. So here, if, if we subtract the low frequencies from the signal and the high frequencies, what do you notice? W what happens to the high frequencies when the low frequencies are high? What happens? What happens to the, to, the, to the high frequencies when the low frequencies are low? Do you see the switch? They alternate? Yeah? OK, this has been seen elsewhere. Do you know where? This is cat cortex, up and down states. All right? Uh, this is a highly cortical uh, pattern. However, this is much accelerated. Here we, we, we are in hours, and this here is, is actually milliseconds. But up and down states had actually never been seen before uh, in a non-mammalian species. So uh, this gave a lot of uh, acid reflux to quite a few um, uh, PNAS reviewers um, because what we were saying was that, in fact, the neocortex was at best sufficient but not necessary for the production of 
what were believed to be highly cortical patterns. So uh, Francis was seeing all of this um, before, before it was published. He passed in 2004. And then he asked me this question. He said, what does this have to do with consciousness? Because quite a few people believe that REM sleep is associated with consciousness. And now you're seeing, all the, all of, you're seeing REM sleep in these birds. So I thought about it. And I thought the best way to actually answer Francis's question was to have a conference uh, and invite other people who actually look at data and just um, look at the data in a very dispassionate way. And this is what we did. Uh, this was in 2012 uh, in Cambridge. And we reviewed the literature and uh, noticed a few things. So first of all, the human brain is not uh, the heaviest, right? We're right over here between a cow and a dolphin. Uh, where's the human brain in this slide, left or right? Right. OK, what's left? Pardon? Twins? No. Uh, <laughs> no, a, 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 that's a bottlenose dolphin on the left side. Uh, orca on the left side. Um, blue whale on the left side. Uh, then you, you can see there are quite a few different brains that are all highly complex. Um, and so we're told, well, don't worry about this. We will just come up with a new measure called the EQ, the encephalization quotient. And it is a ratio between the uh, actual brain mass and the expected body mass given uh, the size of the animal. So it tracks sort of brain to, uh, to body ratio. And if you do this peekaboo, we are straight on top again. right? Uh, a, so if we actually follow this argument, uh, at infinitum, we realize that you know, if this were to be true, uh, fat people would be dummies and babies would be geniuses. So, we're told, no, don't worry about this. This is just to actually compare with other species. OK. So if you actually look at insects, and if you look at light birds, they actually have a higher brain-to-body mass ratio than humans. Uh, and we're told, well, don't worry about this. They can't possibly be conscious because they don't have these guys, right? Von Economo neurons, spindle cells. And so if you ask, well, why are spindle cells so important? They're very important because when you brush your teeth in the morning, these cells are firing. And that means that you're actually uh, recognizing yourself. There's only one problem. Uh, magpies recognize themselves in the mirror, and they don't actually have spindle cells. So we sort of decided that it was time to take a position scientifically and repudiate the Cartesian hypothesis uh, that, in fact, consciousness had to be limited to the human experience. Uh, and this was uh, embodied in a document that was actually circulated before the um, the, uh, the event, uh, most of the edits were actually cosmetic, except for Jak uh, Panksepps, who, who unfortunately passed away recently. Uh, and it was done in this room, the Balfour Room. Uh, Stephen Hawking was a guest of honor. Actually, I brought the original declaration here today. And uh, the, this led to another declaration in Brazil with, veterinari uh, with, with uh, leading veterinarians who said, um, uh, animals are not things. They are sentient beings. Accordingly, we should not treat them like objects. And even the federal seeing eye dog seemed to, to agree with that statement. Um, it led to the Declaration of Lisbon, which pretty much said if you're going to use an animal in, in your research, you should actually um, film th that work and uh, be ready to uh, report the work to um, uh, funding agencies. And you should also actually have a, a business plan to explain why you're doing this particular experiment. Okay. So if I told you that in my lab at NASA, uh, in Silicon Valley, we actually kill 100 million vertebrates per year, we burn $40 billion per year, and our chance of actually getting a result that actually has anything to do with humans is about less than 6%, we probably would not have you know, had the highest value uh, series A and seed uh, in biotech history. So it turns out that I wasn't the first person to, to think of, of EEGs as, as clouds. Uh, there was a very beautiful paper uh, by the Nicola Lilly's lab and again, no thresholds, right? Uh, we know with all the variables. The only problem is that this is, this is invasive, so you have to put electrodes in the hippocampus, the stratum, the cortex, and the thalamus. Um, the colors look very seductive, but there, there actually hasn't been a comparison with the manual scoring. And finally, it hasn't been applied to humans. And uh, every once in a while, a person will say, well, hang on, isn't WT weight training? And you know, this is rats. It's whisker twitching. But if you need to see a rat weight train, there you go. Um, so, so if it turns out that we can extract a lot of signal from a single EEG, that means that theoretically we should be able to um, 
we should be able to come up with probes that are much simpler to use, right? So here's one case study. So we decided to use a human electrode on a rat, uh, which would be far, and not make any surgery, right? So it would be much less traumatic for the rat and for the graduate students. Um, and so this is, these are 30 second uh, examples of data. He, uh, here you have uh, um, um, quiet wakefulness, active wakefulness, uh, light anesthesia, and deep anesthesia. We run this with the algorithm, and there we go. Uh, in dark blue, we have deep anesthesia, uh, in fuchsia, light anesthesia, and the rest, wakefulness. So the same can, uh, can also be done with humans, both in a supervised and unsupervised way. So with slow wave sleep here, wakefulness here, REM sleep over here, and intermediate sleep state uh, over here. In fact, here you have three patients at the Max Planck Institute. Um, all the dots correspond to 30 seconds of, of brain activity. Um, the top, all the scoring is done by a human who receives uh, a monsoon of information. The bottom, uh, it is the algorithm. This was, or, or, this was already done 10 years ago. Uh, and, and at that time, it could actually come up with a similar result in less than a minute. So importantly, we were able to actually come up with maps. So if we use this preferred frequency trick that was developed initially for birds, but on humans, you can see now that uh, you don't just have um, noise. Every sleep and waking state has its own signature here. And you can, you can, ver you can confirm this with Kolmogorov Smirnov tests, including wakefulness and REM sleep. And this is just with a single EEG. So, um, and the nice thing about this is, of, co of course, not only do we compare the results of the algorithm with uh, the human score, but we can actually use these signatures to see who has a, uh, a tighter um, um, a score. In other words, uh, who is more reliable? In other words, if you have a human or an algorithm who is not reliable, we know that, that the, the scoring has to be wrong. Otherwise, you can be reliably right or reliably wrong. But we can actually compare the data with itself in each category. Uh, and here, you have eight hours of sleep, again, and usually you would only see these movement artifacts, but again, we can clean up the signal. And now, this is the same person, and you can see slow wave sleep over here, you can see spindles over here, gamma over here, and even ultra-high gamma. And this is a single non-invasive EEG, which was very surprising. So, the idea is to get biomarkers of the hippocampus, of the, uh, the thalamus, of the cortex, but using um, EEG, using electrical signals, um, and doing this now you know, from the home. So uh, another uh, variable I invented during my PhD was, was called the temporal fragmentation. So it is the normalized mean of the absolute value of the temporal the gradient of a doubly normalized spectrogram. In other words, uh, it tells us where the spectrum breaks. And if you notice here, the red dots, they're bimodal. This is REM sleep. It doesn't depend if the data has been scored manu manually or automatically. It appears that the baseline of REM in and of itself happens, is bimodal. And this is true with the American data. It's true with the German data as well. And it is statistically significant. OK, so around that time, uh, I decided to um, build a company which would actually build a, a device so that we could actually start getting data from all over the world and, and making inferences that, uh, that um, we couldn't make if I, if I um, didn't actually build a product. So we started here in San Diego. Uh, this, an intern took this picture. Uh, this is me receiving Red Bull at 4 in the morning or coffee. Yeah. And, uh, and so we built a device. So this, is, this was the first generation device. Um, and it's been on the market since 2009. Um, the uh, pharmaceutical companies have been using this in order to actually see uh, what effect the drugs were producing uh, on the brain. Um, the lady is also in the market because she's my ex-fiancé. Uh, but more importantly, the most important thing about this is the data. So here you have uh, waking EEG with the alpha waves. You don't want to see alpha contaminations of REM sleep because uh, you would know that this person could actually have um, fibromyalgia. Uh, stage 1 sleep, you don't want to see this in anybody who is driving. Uh, spindles. You, um, with people who have psychosis, very often you see fewer sleep spindles in stage two. Um, delta waves, uh, there is a paucity of uh, stage three that occurs in uh, individuals with um, 
with Alzheimer's and then REM sleep, people who suffer from chronic depression are going to have far more REM sleep. They're going to hit REM sleep very quickly. This is a short REM latency, and they're going to spend more time in REM as well. So what I'm telling you for those people with an engineering background in the audience is we're changing the transfer function. We're putting much less stuff on people, and we're getting more bandwidth out of them, right? OK. So uh, during the rest of my presentation, I'm going to walk you through a few vignettes, a few things that we've inferred. This is data that we've already collected over the last few years. Um, and there are a few cool things that we've been able to do. This is all human-based. OK. So uh, raise your hand if you know these plots. OK. This is a hypnogram. So a hypnogram tells us in what state a person is uh, at a given time, which waking or sleep state. And it's actually a very dumb plot because, uh, and I'll, I'll show you why. So this was done with, with the Navy. Uh, they wanted to borrow some of our equipment. And when we did the hypnogram, we, sh we showed, okay, this person here has uh, some uh, slow wave sleep. It's unlikely that uh, he or she has MCI or, or Alzheimer's. There is stage two sleep. It's unlikely that this person is psychotic. There is a little bit of REM sleep. It's unlikely this person is suffering from depression. There are quite a few arousals. But we actually need to look at the data with a finer uh, level of granularity. Here, this is the same data, uh, the same person. And now we can notice a few things. Yes, uh, there was little REM sleep, but the REM is spectrally very choppy. Do you know in what, which condition this happens? Brain. No, close. PTSD? Yes. Uh, OK, there is stage two, but there's actually a slow wave contamination of stage two. Where does that happen? Which pathology? Anybody? TBI, traumatic brain injury. No, no, but, that, no, but you, you, you said this for, in answer to the other question. Uh, and, and then it turns out, that if, you, if, if you compare the spindle count in stage two here with what we have, uh, there are too many spindles. Where does that happen? Anybody knows? Uh, pardon? No, that's if you have too few. But if you have too many, usually uh, you see this with treatment with, with an SSRI. Um, so, th so we told the, the, the military, we said, OK, we don't, we don't think this person is psychotic. We don't think this person is depressed. We don't think this person has a cognitive impairment close to MCI or Alzheimer's. But we do think this person is a candidate for traumatic brain injury. We think he's a candidate for PTSD. And we think that you actually drug them with an SSRI. And within 45 minutes, they said, you're right on, you're right on, on, on all of those. And we can do this actually at a higher resolution as well. OK. Um, so the story about autism these days is, is that it's a big um, spectrum, right? Everybody talks about the autism spectrum. Uh, and uh, about 16, 17 years ago, people were talking about sleep as a continuum. So I'm very skeptical about this whole spectrum idea. Um, so we have collected data now. Uh, and this is not for pictures and so on. Um, we have, because this is very preliminary data. Uh, and I wouldn't call it the result yet, but we have data from uh, girls with Rett syndrome in Switzerland and uh, boys with autism in California. And we see in quite a bit of the data in the first four hours of sleep, times when we have a break in the spectrum, a high te temporal fragmentation, and the preferred frequency sh uh, shows up uh, in the bitter range. Uh, and this doesn't happen to be a seizure. So we, and the nice thing is we always use the same equipment throughout. So, it's too early to call this a result, but it might be that the autism story is far more discreet than, than we had thought, just like the sleep story as well. So um, here we have uh, an interesting case. We had a person come to, and see us a few years ago, and he said, I, I read about you guys in the press. Uh, can you do a study on, on me? And um, we said, no way. Uh, we are a bunch of nerds. We're PhDs. If you have a problem, go to the ER. And he said, well, I went to the ER, uh, and they gave me a sleeping pill and an aspirin, and in the meantime, I already got into a car accident. I'm really not feeling well. Can you look at what's happening in my brain? So we did an N of one study. We did informed consent. And this is what we found. We have an algorithm that scores sleep at a one second resolution. In blue is the algorithm. In green is a blind human, I mean blind to the algorithm, um, scoring the data. And you can see an alignment, so this, they, they agree. Very often, this person was waking up all the time. On average, he was awake every 1.4 minutes. The maximum amount of sleep that he had undisrupted was 18 minutes. 
he was dying. And in the ER in San Diego, he just got a sleeping pill and an aspirin. Um, he was dangerous to himself and to other people. Uh, we immediately uh, uh, showed this data to uh, the best hospital in town, uh, and they, uh, they uh, reset his circadian rhythm with uh, a, um, a light box, and, uh, and he's alive. So this year, Stephen Hawking, um, and uh, Stephen uh, asked me a few years to help him uh, with his communication needs. And no pictures here, please. No pictures. Otherwise, I'm not showing this. Uh, I have to respect uh, his privacy. So no pictures, no taping. Um, so so uh, Stephen had this problem. He said, you know, right now, I want to communicate with um, my cheek muscles. And um, uh, I want to be prepared for the day when I lose this ability to be able to communicate. Can you help? And we said, well, we will do our best, but we want to make sure that we can actually help other people who have ALS as well. Uh, and he said, no problem. He actually um, uh, was very supportive. And we started doing experiments um, on Stephen. And here you have Helena uh, from Oxford who went to see Stephen and who is asking him some crazy questions. She's asking him if he has a pet giraffe, if he was born in Argentina. And the whole point is to startle him uh, to see if he has the right uh, EEG response to startle. And if, in, in fact, he did have that. Looks like you guys don't have the sound. Oh, you do, OK. But um, that's not important. So what's important is this. We actually did something very cruel to Stephen. We asked him to imagine that he could move. And in fact, I did that myself to him uh, in, his, in his kitchen. Um, and again, no photos. Um, the left side is uh, a traditional Fourier transform. And here, Stephen is resting. Um, on the uh, lower left side, uh, we're asking him to imagine that he can squeeze his right hand. On the right side, uh, you, see, you don't see much of a response when he's resting, but you can see these pulses when we run our analysis, uh, even though you know, with the traditional Fourier transform, we don't see anything. We see this with the left hand as well. We see this with the right foot, with the left foot. He hasn't moved these in, in decades. Um, and we see this when he physically opens and closes his eyes as well. So we read the analysis. Uh, this is Calvin, who works with me. Uh, we read the analysis a few years ago at NASA. And it's getting very, very sharp. So now, uh, in green, is, which you see below, green and red, this is when we, when we give the order to, to begin intent. Red is when we, uh, when we uh, order him to stop imagining. And you see these peaks over here. This is our detection. Uh, here, he's actually physically opening and closing his eyes. Uh, here, he is imagining that he, can, that he can squeeze his right hand. These are starting to look like the arc delta functions. We're actually picking up his intent. So you're looking at the first neural correlates of intent. Uh, this was actually fast-tracked by the USPTO. We got the patent in two and a half years. Uh, left foot over here. Right foot, left hand. And uh, that means that we could actually conceivably even operate an exoskeleton using this kind of technology. Uh, this is Orguineto. He has Bulbar ALS. I'm going to skip the video, but after the Q&A, those of you who want to, to hang, uh, I can show you the, um, the, uh, the video. Uh, but to make a long story short, he is the first person who actually spelled with his mind alone, with a single non-invasive EEG eye brain on May 21st, 2013. He spelled this word, communicate. Um, we were not sure if he was going to say communist, but it was actually communicate. So, um, and, and I have a video of actually Augie spelling with his muscles. I can, I can show this very quickly. And the idea, the idea to start people's, um, to let them spell with their muscles before they're paralyzed is actually good because it enables us to learn the library of words and associations that they used uh, most often. So he started with an F. I don't know if you can see this very well. F over here. And I apologize, I'm going to go just a couple minutes over time, but I will speak quickly. Thank you. Oh, what word do you think he's spelling? It's a pretty important word if you're paralyzed. Pardon? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. He was able to spell better with eye brain 
uh, being paralyzed and uh, somebody else uh, who has uh, functional hands but no functional brain. Uh, so, so here he's actually controlling the interface with, with his muscles, and he spelled food. Yeah. Okay, you, we can actually use multiple, multiple uh, um, channels here. We have the iBrain 2, which is a multiple channel uh, device, and then it becomes very, very easy because then we don't need a diagonal, diagonal confusion matrix with a single channel, and we can just look at the activation pattern. So you can use a Huffman encoding in order to have a maze and uh, choose particular letters, and then all you need is left and right. And so you subtract one signal from the, from, from the other, and then you have left hand and right hand, so you can navigate pretty quickly. That's the system we're building for Steven. So this is Elon uh, Musk, who's visiting uh, the old lab in San Diego, and I was looking at this picture and I was thinking, since we have this additional bandwidth now, we should, in theory, be able to make the devices much smaller, just like for the birds, uh, right? So it turns out we did. So this is the iBrain 3, a prototype. Um, and actually, I have a version here. I just was at uh, NASA at uh, Johnson Space Center yesterday. They wanted on the ISS. Um, and the other, the other people who wanted it as well. Uh, there is an ICU uh, who wants it on every single person uh, coming in. Uh, also for Alzheimer's in San Diego and in Toronto, it's been requested. But the point is, you know, if you do a traditional analysis, you don't see anything, but we're able, again, to recover part of the signal, so we're able to place the electrodes closer than other people can. This was a test that was done at NASA uh, last year, and we had for about 44 signals uh, that the algorithm had to pick up, uh, and we shaved 40% of the bandwidth, and it was able to pick up about 43 of them, so this was a good thing. Uh, this communicates to, uh, to your phone, back to us, so the idea uh, is that if you have a phone, which the chairman of Qualcomm has, or even if you use an antiquated BlackBerry or whatever this, that you want to use, we can actually get the data back to us and look for anomalies and then uh, send alarms. And again, there's no animal research. This is all human-based. It's all preventive. So as I said, uh, the ISS is interested now in, 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 um, in having this, so we have to make the device uh, space ready. Um, and then I'm just, just going to tell you very shortly about a new a new uh, endeavor. Um, who here knows about the Brain Initiative? Okay, so, so the Brain Initiative um, was launched um, actually on, on that day here at the White House uh, by President Obama, and the idea was to actually have an investment in the neurosciences, which over a decade would uh, mirror or even surpass the investment that was made um, in uh, the, uh, the, um, the genome. And uh, during that day, uh, when I was, when I was uh, at the White House, right over there, uh, I saw there was a press release that came out, and it said, oh, people now, through this, thanks to this, are going to be walking and talking again. And I was running up and down the White House, and I said, you know, this is actually a big lie, because uh, it seems to be a purely academic exercise, which is fine, but you don't have a single MD, and you don't have a single engineer on your committee. Um, maybe what we need is also a patient-centric approach. So when I said I complained to everybody, I complained to everybody. Uh, and... And I, was, and I said, you know, there is a case to actually create a Silicon Valley for the brain because uh, a place like this, which are called Neurozone, could have a huge economic impact. And so I was, said, uh, I was told, okay, well, go around the country and see, see if there is a reception for this. Uh, so Congress got behind it. Uh, the city of San Diego got behind it as well. They put 42 and a half acres on the side actually here in San Diego. Um, and... The, and um, a number of other places also jumped uh, on this opportunity. So uh, the state of, um, of um, Wyoming uh, is also very interested in this, but they don't have much infrastructure, so it's going to take a much bigger investment. Uh, Arizona is very interested, in particular the city of Phoenix. Um, uh, recently, I, I was contacted by the state of Nevada. Uh, they have the Louisville Institute as well. They are interested. And then in Canada, Vancouver, Montreal, uh, and Waterloo, and Toronto. Uh, I cannot say which, but um, a few days ago, one of the places I just mentioned uh, donated for the project 140,000 square feet uh, and wanted to put $200 million in the project. $100 million to uh, renovate the building uh, or the buildings, and then $100 million fund in order to attract people. And by what I mean people, it's not just companies, but also labs and other facilities from all around the world to, to, to work on these kinds of technologies. So here you've got Montreal. This is, the site is, is, is uh, in that area. Um, Wyoming. Um, and I'm just going to close with uh, one observation. 
Uh, in 2006, Rusty Gage, whose lab discovered adult neurogenesis, or could discover it, uh, made a prediction. He said, within 50 years, neuroscientists with help from other disciplines will have developed a non-invasive device that measures brain activity in real time in free living humans over long distances for indefinite periods. This device will allow scientists and clinicians to study such complex processes as attention, perception, and consciousness at the most fundamental levels. This basic understanding will lead to new approaches to developing therapies for cognitive diseases such as schizophrenia, autism, depression, and Alzheimer's. Um, I had coffee with the Rusty uh, a few months ago, and he said there's one thing wrong about this quote. What do you think it was? Exactly. He, he said, I said this 10 years ago. You guys are doing it now. It won't take 50 years. Thank you very much. Three, three minutes. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you. And we got here. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Anybody with a question? Oh, my goodness, Phil. Good. You just stunned them. We got one in the back there. Okay. All right, good question for you. Have you taken your, so in the example of finding signatures or earmarks of intent, have you coupled that to, uh, say, the supplementary motor area? Have you taken your results and then tried to link it to supplementary eye fields and things like that? That's a great question. So, so we, we don't know yet if we're, if we're hitting SMA. We think this may be SMA or it could be M1. Uh, so we haven't done that yet. We would love to know exactly which area we're hitting. Uh, but we have additional data now. Uh, we've been recording from uh, a number of ALS sufferers in Philadelphia, uh, and, they, and they're showing this, this pattern as well, and uh, you know, people who are not paralyzed as well. So we have been using this to help uh, you know, Hawking and, and ALS sufferers with, with this particular use case, but it would be very interesting to find out exactly where the signal is coming from, I agree. You showed in your pictures two different Loci, more vertex, and then forehead. What, what's your current device? Where is it located? Oh, so the recording electrode is frontal. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. That's, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if you'd considered using any kind of normative data, human data, for EEG so that you could do operant conditioning using your device. I, I, I didn't hear the, the, the second half. Could you use your device to then generate a neurofeedback training protocol? Oh, for neurofeedback, yeah. So that you could use, oper you could you operantly condition. Sure. Good. Sure. Yeah. Up front here. Sorry, there was one thing early on you said I didn't understand. You said that the uh, energy is, all low, is mostly at low frequencies, but the information is at all frequencies. But I thought Nyquist's theorem would have it mostly at higher frequencies? No, uh, okay, so good question. Um, these are two different things. So uh, the EEG is one over F, the power goes with the square of the amplitude. So you have a one over F squared relationship between the frequency and the voltage. So you have these slow waves that have a very high amplitude and then these fast waves uh, with a slow am uh, lower amplitude. Nyquist, so if you're sampling, Nyquist just tells you that you will be able to see something uh, at, um, until half of the sampling frequency. Here, we were not sampling at 40 hertz, right? We were sampling at, at, I think, one kilohertz. And I was just showing you that there was more than 20 hertz where we could go all the way to 100 hertz. So um, that's one thing. Uh, the the um, power, most of the power is going to be at these low frequencies. But if you normalize the, si the signal, you can see there's actually information at higher frequencies as well. But I'm not saying that we're going beyond that quest because we're not sampling at 40 hertz. We're sampling at, at 1,000 hertz. One last question. Yeah. I, another thing I didn't see on your application list is uh, anesthesia depth monitoring. It's a hot field of uh, the EEG based monitoring, as so, and the same thing for uh, coma patients and detecting awareness in I'm sorry, which vegetative patient? state patients yes. detecting awareness. Yes. But the anesthesia field is very hot about this. You, you're absolutely right. We actually, I did show you some anesthesia data, but this was on rodents. So the, so the, the rodent data was anesthesia data. Uh, and then for vegetative state, um, the, te the technology that we're using for ALS could actually be applied. So actually, a few years ago, uh, when Ariel Sharon, uh, the former prime minister of Israel, was, uh, in, was thought to be in vegetative state, we were asked to actually go there uh, and run an experiment on him. And unfortunately, we were on standby, and he passed before we could actually um, we, we, we could, we could see him. But we actually developed a test 
uh, using the, this thermal grill illusion. Are you familiar with that? Yes. OK, so the thermal grill illusion, um, you pretty much, you, you can do it with a bunch of vegan hot dogs at home. Uh, and what it is is uh, you, you, you put five in, in, the, in, in the freezer, and the, that other five you, know, you leave at ambient temperature, uh, and you, you, you just put one of each kind uh, in a row. And if you put your hand on that, you'll feel a, a, a burning sensation. And so you, when you do that, you should actually have a startle response on the UAEG as well. So we were looking for, you know, to do these kinds of things on people who are vegetative to actually see if they may have some sort of awareness. So we are very interested in that. Uh, but, you know, uh, when you run a company, uh, one of the things you have to do is, unfortunately, you don't publish as much. You actually go for the patents. And you don't have many grants. You actually go for the contracts. And you have to do more wood and fewer arrows. So we, had, we, we focused ourselves on the effect of pharmaceutical compounds on the brain. Uh, but we're not putting anything off the table. Okay. OK. And with that, thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Dr. Law, I keep calling Professor.